Hey everybody, it's Tony at COPO, and I promised a more in-depth tutorial this next time around, and I think I kind of overdid it a little bit on this one. This gets a little complicated, so keep your finger hovered over that pause button, get your notepads ready, because there's going to be a lot of pausing and going back. But ultimately, what you're going to discover is this is relatively easy. If I stop talking and I just went from start to finish, you'd be surprised how quickly something that seems relatively complex can come together rather quickly. Uh, I know I was excited about it, so I hope you guys are too. So let me quit my yapping here and get into the tutorial. It's gonna be kind of a long one, so I'm gonna go as quick as possible. I hit Control Tab to get out of full screen mode, hit View to get into my editor here. I'm gonna create a cube. It's gonna come in at the center of XYZ000. And when you resize a parametric object, it resizes from the center. So with this cube selected under Object Tab, I'm gonna change the X to 75 wide, Y to 20 centimeters tall, and Z to 50 deep. I hit O on the keyboard to zoom it up. I want to turn on my lines around here for a second. I want to copy and paste the original cube because I want to make a copy that sits right on top of itself. If I hold down Shift while I'm sliding it up, it constrains it to 10 centimeter increments. And I know the cubes are 20 centimeters high, so I just move it up 20 centimeters, and it's sitting right on top of that thing. And each cube is going to have its own originating XYZ center point, but I want these two cubes where they sandwich together, I want that to be resting back at the zero zero of the scene. So if I turn on filter grid, you can see this bottom cube is originating at the XYZ. I want the center where the two meet. So if I grab the top one, you see its center is here, the bottom one centers here, but if I grab both of them, it averages out the selection handle between the two centers of those objects. And that works out perfectly for us because these are identical objects. I know I can mathematically just move that back down to zero and it centers those out. I also want the back of these cubes to line up with the X plane in Z space because any new objects I create, they're going to come in at this world space of zero, zero, zero. I want them all to line up with the back center of these two objects here. So the quick way is just to move these two objects forward. So with both of them selected, I know they're 50 centimeters deep in Z space, so I just need to offset them in Z half of their width because they're originating from the center. So if I just go in Z 25, or I could even use cinema as a calculator, do 50 divided by 2. And that pushes everything in Z space forward, and it lines up the backs of our object on the X plane and the middles of our objects in the Y direction. So any new object I create is going to come right in here at 0, 0. So if I create a new null, it comes right in at 0, 0, 0, and it just lines up with the backs of our cubes because that's where we move them. So if I call this top cube and I call this bottom cube, and I grab both of those and I put them in the null, now I can grab the null, and the null is at 0, 0. Instead of each one of these boxes having different coordinates, I can grab the null that's in that zero. So at any point, if I have my move tool, I can move these boxes around, I can rotate them. They can get all messed up, but the coordinates inside of the null of the cubes, the cubes are unaffected. They're taking on the rotation of the parent object. So the top and the bottom cube stay zeroed out. So with the null selected, I just want to bring this back to home at any point. I can go in through here and tab through and reset these all by zero. But I created a shortcut here for reset position, scale, and rotation. You can find that also by hitting Shift C on the keyboard and just type PSR. And you get reset PSR and you can double click it here. But in my case, I added a shortcut for it here. With one click of a button, hit PSR, and it brings all the rotation and the position back to zero. Again, if I move this, rotate it, hit it one time, and it snaps everything back to zero. And that works out really great. From here, I want to connect these two objects together. And we do that under Simulate Dynamics Connector. And a connector comes in at the 0, 0, 0 point of our scene. But because it's oriented by default in the Z direction, we need to rotate it to line up with the back of our boxes here. So with the connector selected under the Coordinates tab, you could change the heading. And if I just spin this around to 90 degrees, now we've oriented that connector running parallel with the back of our boxes. And remember, we moved our boxes forward, and that's why this is lined up. It's just helping us during the building process just to line things up quicker. 
So the connector doesn't render in the scene, it's just a visual display for us. And this represents two connection objects. So the tan is going to represent object A, the blue is going to represent object B, and they're going to pivot around each other. Under your connector object settings, you have different types of connectors. We're going to stick with the hinge, but you can have ball and socket, slider, ragdoll, all these different things. Hinge is going to do exactly what we want. It's just going to connect these two together as though they were a door or a box lid. So once you add a connector to a scene, you have to connect objects to it. So with the connectors object tab here, you see object A and object B. So we want object A to be the bottom of our box here. So I'm going to grab bottom and I'm going to drag it into the slot. And watch what happens here. It draws this line out here to the center of mass of attachment A. So object A is the bottom and it aligns it to the center of mass and the center of mass is that originating point of that box. So if I grab the box you see XYZ here in the center. That's the default center of mass of any object that you create. The connector is disappearing though when you click off of it. By default it turns off so you hit display always visible. So now when I select the box that connector stays visible. And you can see it's connecting from the pivot point of object A of that hinge to the center of mass of that box. So again, when we do the same in reverse, if we grab the top box here, you can see its center mass is here. So we're going to grab our connector and tell it connect object B to the top. And it's going to also do the center of mass. And now it drew a line here. So if I turn off this in the viewport you can see it's added these little connectors out here. But when I hit play nothing happens yet because connectors only work with dynamics because it's under the simulation tab. So what we need to do is we need to add dynamics to the two cubes and the quick way is grab them both at the same time. I created shortcuts for the simulation tags here and you can right click to get to that as well. But with both selected, I can just hit rigid body tag. And if I hit play, everything is going to fall out of the scene because now the rigid bodies have mass and gravity and they're falling and they're not hitting anything. But while I'm setting up the hinge and I want to demonstrate it for you, I want to keep one of these boxes from falling. Let me turn off my grid for a second here. And I want the top box to remain in place. So if I just grab its dynamics tag here and go under the dynamics tab, I can turn dynamics off and essentially that's turning that into a collider body now. So if I turn off my connector temporarily, when I hit play, the collider body will stand still, the rigid body will fall away as expected. So then when the connector is connecting the bottom to the tan and the top to the blue, I hit play, the bottom's going to fall away, be connected and it's going to swing out. Now there's another option under the connector. If I slide this up, go to connector. At the bottom here, angular limit. If I turn this on, you're going to see a new shape appear. Now this is called the limiter. And this is kind of a stopper. And the tan is connected to the bottom object and the blue is connected to the top object. But by default, when you create a hinge, it comes in with its orientation to the X of an object. But our objects are facing in Z space because we rotated the, the hinge along the back of our boxes. So when I hit play, this thing's going to act kind of weird. It doesn't really know what's happening because everything's upside down and backward. So if I realign the reference axis to the Z of the object, of both the top and the bottom. Now you can see these stoppers kind of reoriented themselves. Now I can tell this to go something like minus 45 to 45. And there's your tutorial. We made a Pac Man game. Thank you for watching, everybody. Waka waka. Set that back to 45. So now this tan stopper is connected to this bottom, and the blue stopper is connected to the top. And the top is our collider body, so it's not moving. So this blue paddle won't move. But the tan will be attached to the bottom, so it's going to move with it. So this is going to spin down and slap into there and stop itself from moving, just like that. So we can 
change these settings as this slides around you can see now it has a little bit more range of movement in here if you want to limit how far a door opens or a box lid swings stopper is really great for that I'm going to turn that off though because we don't need it I just wanted to explain what it does now we want to connect the box lids together with a spring so we're not just relying on gravity to fling them open we're going to add a spring in here and under simulate dynamics spring now that's going to come in at the 000 point let's go to our connector display and turn that off for now and go back to the spring unlike the connector when a spring comes in it does not show anything until you add the object to it so we're going to add the bottom object as a and now you can see it draws a spring in we're going to drag the top as object b and if i grab this the spring disappears so just like the connector if i go under display make it visible now i can come back grab an object and if i move it you can see it's connected those two boxes together with a spring and again just like before it's going to the center of mass so it's connecting that spring this is a linear spring and a linear spring is going to try to draw two objects together to a set distance by default it's going to try and place 100 centimeters between the two objects we're going to set that to zero later i, I don't want to explain the, the linear spring at this moment i want to explain the angular spring now angular is a torsion spring which tries to push objects apart the linear tries to draw them together and because it comes in with the orientation away from the camera in Z we do the same thing we did with the connector in coordinates we just want to spin this around 90 degrees so now our spring is in alignment with the back of our objects and running parallel with our hinge If I go under display I can shrink this down I want to move that top cube back down to 10. Now when I hit play, you can see that spring has a lot of tension and it's flipping that bottom box around. So in addition to the gravity that's making that box drop, the spring tension is flipping it around. But you notice the two boxes are passing through each other. And even though we added rigid body dynamics, this connector under object is overriding any collision because when you create a new connector by default it has ignore collisions on but we don't want to ignore those collisions we want those two boxes to hit into each other so we just want to disable this we want it to say don't ignore the collisions and now when I hit play that I'll fling around and it's going to smack into the box so for now I want to reverse the order of these to continue with the demonstration so I'm going to take the top box that was a Collider body, I want to go to dynamics. I want to turn dynamics on, making it a rigid body again. And now I'm going to turn the bottom one, I'm going to turn dynamics off. So this becomes the collider, which is going to be stationary. This becomes the rigid, which is going to move around. So now if I hit play, this box is being flung around in clockwise motion, but it's colliding with the box under here, so you don't see anything happening. So with the spring selected, under the rest angle of zero if I put that in a negative direction if I go minus 90 degrees and I hit play it's gonna go counterclockwise so now that spring is gonna fling that box open and just like we connected the hinge to the boxes we want to align the spring to the Z of object of the top and of the bottom and you can see it acts a little bit differently just by changing the orientation of that alignment now the box is springing open a little bit more naturally I noticed when I was running my setup though if I changed it on the top from the Z of object to the direction of object the box didn't fling open as far and I found that's actually working better for the technique I'm about to show you guys so you gotta experiment once you get a basic understanding of what these things do come in here and mess with these settings and see if it works out better for your calculations now you notice when it's swinging open it's got this nice fluid spring movement that's based on this damping here so if I hit play 
you see it flings open nice and slow, but if I change the default of 20 up to 100, now it just kind of really slowly opens, almost like this is on hydraulics now. And the opposite, if I set this to zero, it's going to have a really springy motion because there's no damping on there. So that gives me this really nice back and forth motion, but it's really slow for what I want. So I can bump this up to something like five, and you can see it gets a little bit more wicked in here. I can go even more crazy, like 30, and I get this really violent movement here. And if I want an extreme, I can even add another 45 degree angle. I'll just add to 135 degrees. Now this box is really flinging open here. But in addition to it flinging open, I want a force that's going to draw it back together. And that's where that linear spring comes in handy. But if I step forward here, you can see that spring is connected to the center of mass of these objects. But unlike the connector hinge, there's another option under here called offset. And all these other polygon points, this is if you were to convert these objects into geometry, then you could select a random point to connect it to. But we want to keep everything parametric. So we're going to set this to offset for both the top and the bottom box. And instead of being connected to the center of mass of these two boxes, I want to override that mathematically with the spring offset I know my box is 50 centimeters deep. I want to push these two springs toward the front. So I want to go 25 centimeters for the bottom and 25 centimeters for the top. But I want the spring to attach right to the opening of that lid there. So zoom in. Currently, it's still in the center of that. So I want to move this up 10 and this one down 10. So the bottom comes up 10. The top comes down 10, minus 10. And now our spring is connected right at the front of our box. But we don't have our angular spring on. So let's turn both of them on. This is great because you either have angular or linear, but you can also combine the two. So now we've got our angular spring that's forcing the box open. We've got our linear spring that's forcing the box shut. But remember that rest length by default that is 100 centimeters. So when I hit play, this spring isn't pulling it together because it's forcing it to 100 centimeters. So we want to change that to zero. Now when I hit play, you can see it's still not doing its job because we changed the damping and the stiffness of the angular spring. It's a lot stronger, so it's overriding the stiffness of the linear spring. So we just match that number, 30. Now you can see it's a lot stronger, but the damping is keeping it from wiggling. So I'm going to set that damping to zero. And now we have two springs with the equal forces working against each other and it's making the box bounce up and down and that's what I want to do. There's also these elastic stretch limits here and again based on what you're trying to do these could help you fine-tune your settings for your dynamics. I don't need these in my simulation so I'm going to turn these off. Again everything is based on the project you're working on. So get in here, experiment, and see what everything does, and you'll find out there's some really cool stuff that you can do. So now that we've got our two boxes connected together with springs, I want them to interact with something. So I want to bring in a floor. So under my Environment tab, I select a floor. And by default, the floor comes in 0, 0, 0 of our coordinate space. And normally, this is how I like to work. I like the floor to be at ground 0, and then everything's built on top of that and moves up. But I'm going to break my own rule here. I'm going to move my floor down because I want everything we create to still come in at this zero point. So I'm going to grab my floor coordinate and I'm going to move it down 20 in Y. So now that floor is underneath that bottom cube there. And I want to add a collider tag to the floor so it works with the dynamic system. And I'm going to go back to that bottom cube and I'm going to turn dynamics back on. So now the cubes, both cubes, are now rigid bodies. So that means the springs are going to react to both of these, fling them both open, and then the collider body on the floor is going to keep the boxes from falling through. But we have some settings to do because if I hit play, now you can see things are kind of flipping all over the place. Our spring isn't attached to our cubes. So if I grab the spring, the connector, and I make them a child of the bottom, so now they're attached to the bottom's cube, when I hit play, the spring and the connector go along with it. But you can see our balance is off a little bit here. 
So we're going to adjust some more settings. For starters, I'm going to go into the spring display, turn that off, and the connector display is already off. I want to change the center of mass of these objects. So we're basically going to fine tune the balance. So when we hit play, we have more control over the weight of this object so it doesn't flip all over the place. Now remember, the bottom center of mass is in the middle of the cube. The top is in the middle of its cube. And unlike the spring, the connector object does not give you the option for an offset in here. So we go into the actual dynamics tags of both of these objects. I can select them both at the same time, hit the mass tab, and hit custom center. The center of that object is 000, zero, zero of each object, not of the world space, but of the object space. So I want to move these centers of mass forward. Let's do one at a time. I'm going to grab the top one, and I want to slide this one forward. And I want to bring it to the front of that cube, and I want to bring it to the top corner of that cube. So I know the cube is 20 high and 50 deep, and we're starting from the center. So I just want to cut those numbers in half. I want to go 10 up, 25 forward. So 10 and 25. And now this top cube, we've repositioned its weight. That center of mass is now the front top corner of this box. And now we could do the same with the bottom. We could bring that up 25 and down 10. But I don't like where the weight is there. I was messing around with the displacement a little bit of this thing. And I noticed if I brought this back just 10 centimeters forward from the center, not quite to the front, but instead of going down, I want to go up. I want to cheat the center of gravity of this bottom cube. I want to cheat the weight above it, almost to the middle of the cube above it. And when I do that and hit play, now you can see the weight has drastically shifted on this thing. It's helping our balance a little bit, but things are still a little off. So I think that's because there's so much force on these springs, it's flipping everything all over the place. So I want to weight this bottom cube down. So with the bottom cube selected, I grab its dynamic tab under the mass tab. If I change the world density to a custom mass, it's changing the mass to 10 times what its default is. So now when I hit play, this thing is like a rock. It's really heavy. So 10 might be a little too strong. I want to back that off to 1. So if I hit 1 and hit play, now that's kind of bouncing around. It's better, but I want a little more dynamics happening in here. And what we could do is we could change the rotational mass of this. So if I change the default from 100% to 1,000, now watch when this flips around kind of bouncing around a little bit more on the bottom. But I could do the same with the top. I can change the rotational mass of the top from 100. I can double it to 200. And now things are kind of flipping around. And that's actually pretty good rebalance of this thing. It's, it's moving around. It's not flipping over. It's not front heavy or back heavy. And it's getting all the motion that I want in there. And that's really great. If you find when you're running dynamic simulations that things aren't really working out, it's mostly because under the collision tab, under the shape is set to automatic. Let me grab both of these at the same time so I can change them together. If you ever have problems with dynamic simulation, set it to moving mesh and hit play. Now you can see it's really drastically affecting my springs and it's messing up my hinges back here. And Moving mesh isn't working for me. But because these are just simple cubes, I can change the shape. Instead of automatic or moving mesh, I could change it to a box because essentially that's all these are, boxes. And when I hit play, I get a nice simulation, a nice shape of the collision box that's around this thing. But I notice it's kind of skipping around a little bit. If I hit Command D to get to my project settings and go under Dynamics, under this Expert tab, if I change the steps per frame from 5 to 25, what that's going to do is every single frame of this animation, it's going to do more calculations for the dynamics and give you a more accurate result. And because these are just two simple cubes, there isn't a lot of information happening here. So going up to a high number like 25 isn't going to take the computer any time at all to figure out. 
And what you end up getting is a more accurate calculation in the dynamics. So the box lid's closing more, it's bouncing more, interacting with the floor more, and I'm getting much more natural results. And this is really great. However, the second you hit play, everything starts bouncing around. But if we're animating this in a scene and we want control over this, we don't want this to come on as soon as we hit play. Say we want this to come on like a second into the video. So what you could do is go to the two tags, go to dynamics, and you want to turn dynamics off and set a keyframe at frame zero. So now our dynamics are off when you hit play, nothing happens. So you move forward in time to where you want it to turn on, set dynamics on and set a new keyframe, rewind and play, and now they come on at frame 24. Say we wanted to turn off at frame 96, if I turn dynamics off and keyframe it, the problem with this is there's such violent motion happening here. The boxes are flinging all over the place, all the inertia is happening, everything's flying all over. So when I turn dynamics off, the boxes are still going to be flying all over and everything is going to fling it out into space. So we don't want to disable dynamics at frame 96. So I'm going to undo so that frame goes away. Instead, I want this to kind of slowly taper off as though it's losing steam. And I do that under the spring. If I go back down to these stiffness settings, at frame 80, I just want to keyframe the rest and stiffness of these two springs using the current settings of the simulation. But then I want to come forward to frame 96 and I want to set these to zero. Zero, zero, and zero, and then I want to re keyframe these. So what that's doing is it's taking these strengths from full strength at 80 going down to zero across these few frames here. So now when I hit rewind and play, you should see it's going to start, it's going to hit frame 80, and then it's going to slow down. And that's exactly what we want to have happen. That's great. So that's the dynamics portion of the tutorial. And I want to hide the cubes and the floor we created. And I can do that by holding Option and hitting these traffic lights over here. And I want to create a cube. Here's a quick tip. If I go to a different camera view and then back to perspective, it's going to reorient the default camera for cinema. So Y is pointing up, X is left and right and Z is facing away from the camera. So that cube I want to make 10 by 10 by 2 and I hit O on the keyboard to zoom up to it and what I want to do is I want to put a deformer on this cube and the old way of doing it was to go into the deformer menu, add your deformer as a child to your object and then you would have to scale it down because it comes in at this huge size and you don't have to do that anymore. If you delete the taper Grab your cube, O. Oh. If you go to your deformer menu and you hold down shift now in R15, it's going to make that taper a child of the cube and it's going to automatically change the size to the shape of the object. So it's a really great handy tip to save some time. Now if I change the strength here to 65, you can see I didn't subdivide my cube here so it's not following the curvature of the taper deformer. So I go to my cube. And I add some segments here. I want to do four in the height just so we can have some geometry to subdivide here. I could further smooth this out by putting the cube into a subdivision surface, which used to be called a hypernerb. With the cube selected, holding option, it's going to make that a child. Now I find these deformer cages a little bit distracting on my editor. So I want to turn them off, but I don't want to uncheck it because that'll just deactivate it. I just want to turn off the traffic light in the editor for it to hide it. So I'm going to hide that cube, create another cube here. I'm going to make this one 10 by 10 by 8. I just want to subdivide this one 2 by 2 by 2. And again, with the cube selected, if I go to my deformer menu, hold shift, makes the taper child of the cube and resizes it. And then I want to make this one strength of 25. I really want the curvature to be out there, so I'm going to go 350 with it. Again, with the cube selected, holding Option, I made a shortcut for a subdivision surface here. So I just hold Option, click that, and it puts that cube in the subdivision surface. A little quick tip, if you hit Q, you can disable the
the hypernerve, the subdivision surface, and you can see your original low mesh geometry here. Now, again, I want to turn that deformer cage off, just hide that traffic light there. And now we've got a 10 by 10 by 8 cube and a subdivision surface. Under MoGraph, if I create a cloner, it's going to set that cloner in at the same 0, 0, 0 coordinate. And I want to put that cube in there. If I zoom out here, you can see the cloners forcing it up. I want to change the offset in Y back to 0 because I want to offset it in X. And we know that those cubes are 10 centimeters wide, so I just want to offset them 10 centimeters. So they're all touching, and I want eight of them. And if I take that other cube, that first cube we created, and I put it in there, turn it back on, now you can see what the cloners do, and this is cool, is it just alternates between the first shape and the second shape. And if I put another shape in there, like a cone, for example, scale that down, and I put the cone in the cloner, now it's going to alternate between all three of those shapes. And the cloner from iterate to random will now generate those clones in random patterns based on this seed here. So I can mess around with this till I get a random generation that I like. Let's get rid of that cone because what I want to do is change the cloner to blend. And what that's going to do is it's going to create my eight instances from the first shape to the second shape. And then it's going to morph all those shapes in between. And now that saved us a bunch of time in modeling and figuring out all the shapes because Cinema did all the work for us. So now we've got our first shape and our second shape, and then it morphed all those shapes in between. Now this only works with these primitive objects. So if you converted these to geometry, that math wouldn't work out like that. Another great feature of this is you can rotate these clones, and all these parameters are animatable. So this is really cool if you want to do some really funky tricks. But we just want to bend this one back 12 and a half degrees. And also, because the cloner came in at 0, 0, that tooth is sitting centered on that 0 point. So when I add a symmetry object that comes in at 0, 0, I drop the cloner in the symmetry object. Now there's two copies overlapping each other. The mirror plane comes in default, the direction we just happen to want it to be in. But if you're trying to get this to be symmetrical in a different plane, you can change these settings around and get it to clone in different ways. But we happen to want it to come this way. We want to leave that axis point of this symmetry object right here at 0. But I want to see both of these shapes side by side. So I'm going to offset my cloner coordinates. And I know that this shape is. 10 centimeters, so I just want to offset it half that distance to the side. So I go 5 to the side. But if I look at my top camera view, grab the symmetry and zoom in. Because I offset that shape that used to be flat right here, I want to have that curvature mimic it a little bit here. So if I go under the Cloner Transform tab, you can rotate each one of these clone shapes along its path. And we're going to do that in the heading direction. And all you have to do is spin these roughly 5 degrees. And now we've got this nice curvature to our shape. We'll turn off the lines and you can see that. We've got this nice curve happening here. So let's rename these. This is going to be front tooth. This is going to be back tooth. And let's rename that symmetry object top teeth. But what's happening is this is almost too perfectly round. It's, a, it's an exact circle here. I want to have a little bit more of an arc to this. With the symmetry object selected, if you go under coordinates tab, you can change the scale of this. But I want to get it to match those cubes that we created for the dynamic simulation. So let's create a temporary measurement by creating a new cube under object. We're going to make it the same 75 by 20 by 50. And I want to push it back to 25 and Z. Now if I zoom in here, you can see our teeth are outside of that cube. And I can just grab that symmetry object, coordinates, and I can just change the scale of that. Let's go 0.75 in X, and let's go 0.9 in Z. And now that cube 
is encasing those teeth. I can delete the cube because it was just a temporary placeholder. And now you can see we've got some more naturally shaped teeth here that is in a perfect circle. So from here I want to go to our top view. If I grab the symmetry object and zoom in. Under filter I want to turn on my grid. And if I zoom in, I don't know if this shows up in the screencast, but there's smaller grids within the larger grid. And we're going to use that by turning on, under this magnet tool here, we want to enable snapping. We want to turn on the work plane snap and grid point snap. So that means when I create a linear spline and I click out here, these points should be snapping to that grid. But you don't click to close. Grab spline object and you check close spline. And now that's a very simple three point spline here. With the move tool, I can grab this front one here, make it exactly 0, 0, 0, so it lines up with the tip here. And these back ones, I know I want to align them up 50 centimeters back from the front to match our cube. And I know I want them 36 off the center here. So I want this one to go minus 36 in X off center and 50 back in Z and apply that. I want to grab this one and go plus 36 in X and 50 in Z and apply that. So now I have this perfectly symmetrical spline that's lined up with all of my grid points. So if I grab this front point here and I right click, the menu that pops up is because I'm over the axis tool here. So I want to right click out on the screen with that point selected. I want to change it from hard interpolation to soft interpolation. And for good measure, I'm also going to hit equal tangent length. So when I zoom in on this here and grab these handles, you can see whatever I do stretch on one side, it's matching on the other because of that equal tangent length. But if I snap to the grid, it's helping me keep that symmetrical. And you can't really tell because the spline is hidden under the teeth here. So let's switch out to perspective. And I'm going to switch back to the modeling tool, grab the spline. And I'm just going to move it up above those teeth temporarily so I can go back to my top view and see the spline above the teeth. So I go to my point tool. Now you can see, if I zoom in enough to see the smaller grids in here, grab that handle. I basically want to just line that spline up with the highlights of how that deformer is tapering those cubes. So it runs pretty much through the center of them. And that looks pretty good there. And because we had the grid snap turned on, I know that this one is lined up here and everything is symmetrical. Now I want to grab the back two points here. And if I hold shift and grab the other one, if I right click and hit chamfer, that lets me round those back corners off. But we have that hard interpolation that's creating this kink in here. So if I undo, I want to grab my knife tool if I just hit K on the keyboard. And I'm going to snap to this grid point here click and drag. If I hold shift, it's going to constrain it in a straight line. And I just want to cross over the other side of that spline, let go, and it's going to create a point there and a point there. But notice the other points are still selected. So now if I right click and hit chamfer, I could just hit two centimeters here, hit apply. And now I've got this round symmetrical corner back here. Back into perspective mode, if I want to zoom in here, I want to bring that spline back down to the baseline on the floor here. So leave point mode back into object mode, grab the spline coordinates, and just zero it out. Now that spline is back on the floor. Now we want to extrude that spline. So we create an extrude object, drag the spline into the extrude, and it wants to extrude back away from the camera, but we want to go up. So grab extrude, go under object, zero out Z so it's not extruding back and we want to extrude up in Y. I also want to add a cap to the top of this to match the roundness of the chamfer we did on the back side here. So under caps if I create a fillet cap it's going to push it outward so you have to hit constrain and then I want it to be two centimeters to match the chamfer. I want to do that on the bottom as well. Fillet cap two centimeters. But it's just creating one step, so it's got this real flat edge here. So we just want to create two more steps in there. So let's bump the steps up to three, and that's going to round it out. 
Let's do a little bit of math as well. We want the total height from the bottom of the teeth to the top of the gums to be 20. We know the extrude starts at zero and works its way up, and we know the teeth were generated in the middle and they go five centimeters down. So from the bottom of the teeth to the top of the gums, we want a total of 20. But we added a two centimeter cap on top. So five and 15 is 20, subtract the two. So our extrude just needs to be 13 centimeters, giving us a total of five, 13, and two equaling 20. Hopefully that makes sense. Now an issue with extrude is it doesn't weld the cap and the sides and the round here. So you get this hard edge here even when you render a scene. And we can overcome that by putting the extrude into a connect object. I have a shortcut up here because I use it a lot. If you drag the extrude object into the connect, it's going to weld and now that hard edge goes away and it's nice and smooth. But I want to fix some geometry issues that are happening here. So if I turn on shading lines, you can see the spline that's creating the gums is set to adaptive. So if I grab the spline, the intermediate points, it's just trying to average this out to create as little geometry as possible. But look what's happening in the corner. It's creating a ton of geometry over here. We want to override this setting and we just want to make it uniform. And now it's subdividing this shape all the way around in equal sections. But if I turn the lines off here, you can see I've got this nice hard edge on the back. That's because the Fong tag has a default of 60 degrees. If I set this up to 80, now that can round that back out. The other issue is when we subdivided those cubes for the teeth, we left them set to the default of two in the editor. So if I open the teeth and grab both of these subdivision objects, at render time, it's going to subdivide it three times and it's going to put a lot of geometry in there. But in the editor, we want to keep that low poly, so I'm going to throw that back down to only one subdivision in there. So essentially, we're keeping low poly in our editor here, which is great if you're going to put this into a dynamic simulation, which I thought I was going to do originally, but now I've got a new trick to show you guys. But we have a few tweaks to do still before we get to that. Let's call the connector top gums. And what I want to do is I want to get the bottoms of these teeth resting on the floor and I want the back of these gums move forward up to zero on this red line here. So I can grab both of them and I know the teeth are 10 centimeters generated from the middle so they need to come up 5 centimeters. And I want everything to come forward 50 centimeters so I go negative 50 and now when I create a new null that comes in at zero 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 back here and I can grab the gums and the teeth, put them in the null, and now that's the new pivot point. And the gums and the teeth rotate together. So let's call this top assembly. I also want to add a taper modifier inside of this top assembly. But because a null doesn't have geometry, when I hold down shift, it's not going to resize it to anything. It's just going to come in at its default size. So I'm going to shrink it down to 20 by 20 by 20. And it's going to come in here at the 0, 0, 0 point. So in the coordinates, we can move this up 10 and then forward 20. I'm holding down shift here. So now this tapered cage is going to affect both objects in the null. So I can change the strength. And you can see the teeth and the gums are changing at the same time. But now they're intersecting because I didn't put any subdivisions in the extrusion here. So there's nothing to bend. It's just connecting a straight line. So if I grab extrude and just bump up the subdivisions, now there's some geometry in there. And the taper bends together, the teeth and the gums at the same time. So let's make this minus 10 and add a curvature of 250. And now we've got a relatively complex looking model with very little effort. So this is where all that accurate math is going to come into play now. So if I copy and paste this assembly, I'm going to call this bottom assembly. Let's move this under the top one so we're not confused here. Because we lined everything up mathematically accurate to 0, 0, 0, with this bottom assembly selected, I can go to coordinates and just rotate the banking 180 degrees. And everything just mathematically lines up beautifully here. 
and that's because we put everything off the zero 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 space. Now the bottom assembly, because we rotated it, the x axis is pointing downward. So you can come over here to the axis tool and you can rotate that back to zero and hit apply. Now remember to turn that off, otherwise if you start moving it, it's only going to move the axis. We want it to be able to move everything here. So make sure you turn that back off. So now we have our top gums and our bottom gums, but they look exactly the same. Let's turn off our grid while we're doing this. This is the beauty of those taper modifiers. I can grab the taper and I can offset it and change the percentage of the strength and the curvature. And with a couple of tweaks now, it doesn't look exactly the same. And we can come into the teeth front tooth cube taper and we can modify the strength of that one. And again, it's only affecting the front tooth, not the back morph. So we're getting unique shapes all the way across the back when we change that strength. And we can do the same with the top. Top, front tooth, cube, taper. We can bring the curvature up on this one to like 180. We can change the strength. And with just a couple of little tweaks, we've now modified the top from the bottom and they look different from each other without any effort. And now we get to the best tip of the entire tutorial. When I first came up with the idea to do this, I was trying to run dynamic simulations on this assembly with all the teeth and the gums. And even with the subdivided surfaces set to just one level of subdivision, there's still a lot of points in here. And my dynamic simulations was taking a long time to calculate. So to work out the dynamics, that's why I ended up doing this cube simulation that we started with. And then I thought, well, hey, wait a second. If everything can be a child of an object in Cinema 4D, why can't I just run the dynamics on these simple cubes and use them as a proxy and then just attach the high resolution geometry to the proxy of the dynamics? And that's exactly what I ended up doing. So let's rename the null dynamics. And I want to spin it around now. So let's rotate this 180 degrees. And if I hold down shift while I spin it around, I can get it 180 degrees around. And again, because we set all that math up, with everything being centered on the 0, 0, 0 point of our world, everybody lines up perfectly. Now all I have to do is, let's turn our floor back on, open our dynamics, and if I take the bottom assembly and make it a child of the bottom cube, and the top assembly and make it a child of the top cube, I don't want to see these cubes and I don't want them to render, so if I hold Option and hit the traffic lights to hide them, it's going to turn everything off. But if I turn the traffic lights on for the children, they override the parents being turned off and now we can just see the cubes and without having to run any dynamics on our teeth I hit play and it turns on perfectly that was the greatest discovery I found I was thrilled when that all came together so now I didn't have to run any dynamics on this high-res geometry it's just using those boxes as a proxy and everything's solved that is the greatest tip of this entire tutorial but we got to throw some color on this thing and I'm going to try and go as quickly as possible because the tutorial was really about just building the model and showing you how the spring dynamics worked. But we can't just leave this gray shaded. We got to throw some color on it. So I'm going to start by double clicking to create a new material. and I want to open this up. Let's pull this off to the side and turn on our interactive render region. And this first material I'm going to create, we're going to call teeth. And I'm going to leave the default white in here. I'm going to turn off specular. And in the luminance channel, I'm going to create effects lumis. And I'm going to turn off the shader tab here. Just turn off active. And now that's going to give me a more realistic specular light. It's going to have a ping in the middle with some glows. And that's better than what you can get with the default specular in here. And that's why I, I use the luminance channel with lumis instead of specular. We also want to create reflection, and you know you got to put a Fresnel shader on the reflection channel. I'm going to go inside of this though, I'm going to turn on physical, and I'm going to change it from water to plastic. Because we're making a toy here, we want this to look like plastic here. 
And then I want to bring the brightness of the reflection down to about 10. And then the Fresnel, I want to blend that down to about 20. So that's letting 10% of the brightness show through whatever the, the Fresnel's blocking out. I also want to blur the plastic a little bit. I don't want this to be like glass or, or shine. I want to throw a little 10% blur in there. That'll soften our reflection. So that's going to be our tooth. And so we come into our top and bottom assemblies here. Scroll down. We can move this down now. Drag teeth onto top teeth and onto the bottom teeth. Let's rename these. Bottom teeth and bottom gums. Now I want the same material for the gums. I just want to change the color so I can just copy and paste the teeth. Double click that. We'll rename this gums. And I just want to take the color down in the green and the blue and leave red. And just like that, we've got our gums. And we can drag that onto top gums and bottom gums. But we want some reflection in here. So let's create a sky dome around our scene. And if you go into your content browser here, in the prime folder under materials HDR, there are all these preset HDR images. And I like to always use this HDR 025 just because it's interior with some bright windows and it's got some rafters in the ceiling, great material to use for reflections. So I'm just going to drag that onto our sky. Go back to our viewer. Now you can see it's showing up in the renderer. So I want to go under Tags, Cinema 4D Tags, Compositing. And I just want to uncheck Scene by Camera. So that reflection will disappear in the render, but it's still going to show up as a reflection on our material. And what's great about HDRI, if you go to the Mix channel and you dial this down, it's actually going to let this white show through. So we want to turn all the white all the way off. But unlike darkening an image, it's going to actually re-expose it so the windows outside still stay bright. So they're not getting all dingy and gray. So this is what's really cool is you can adjust the brightness like you're stopping down the camera exposure. So we'll just bring that down to 50. And you can see already we've got some great reflections happening as we spin our object around here. Now we also want our floor to have some color to it. So let's create a new texture. Come in here. I'm going to leave the specular on on the floor. I'll leave the color alone. And I want some reflection here as well. I'm going to turn a Fresnel here. And again, I want to go to the physical Fresnel. This one I'm going to change to Teflon. And let's back out to the reflection. I want to blur this one as well to about 5. And let's mix the strength here. Again, we'll go 10 for the reflection and we'll mix the Fresnel shader at 20. We're going to put that on our floor. Let's rename that floor. So let's drag that onto the floor. Now here's the thing that happens though. The floor is going to reflect the sky object as well. And we don't want that to happen. So to override that, just go to that composite tag hit exclusion and drag the floor into exclude and now the floor will still reflect the object but it's not going to reflect the environment around it and that comes in very handy and that's it for our materials so now we want to do some quick lighting in here so let's add a light to our scene it's going to come here in the center let's move it up and over and bring it toward the camera a little bit here. In fact, let's just change the coordinates of this light to minus 100 off to the left, 150 up in the air, and then we want to bring it toward the camera minus 200. And let's turn up the quality of the scene for a second here. And we want to add a shadow to that light. So under the general tab, go to shadow area. Now that's giving us kind of a hard shadow. So what we can do is go under the details section and change the size from 200 to 600. And that's going to look more like a soft box. It's going to diffuse that light in that shadow. But the shadows are pretty dark as well. So I want to go under the shadow tab 
just change the density down to 80 so it's not as intense but we get this really ugly darkness happening here in the shadow side of our model so what we can do is use that reflection map as a light source as well using global illumination but before we do global illumination let's go to our render settings here now I, I did a custom setup because I'm always using ambient occlusion and global illumination so I just added them from the effect menu here and then I just saved my layout so I don't have to keep adding these every time I create a new document I want to turn ambient occlusion on for the scene but by default the ray length is 100 centimeters but we scaled our object down quite a bit so I want to shrink the ray length from 100 down to 10 and that's going to give us some ambient occlusion in here just to fill in the cracks with some extra shadows and some contact shadows here make it a little more realistic but under global illumination as you know in R15 they've rewritten the entire global illumination engine and they've done all these presets for you so I'm just going to save some time here and grab one of these presets there are many other tutorials out there explaining the new global illumination so I'm not going to waste time with that here so I'm just going to do an interior high as my default and what that's going to do when I go back out here it's going to calculate all the light coming from that sky map into the scene and it's going to fill in those shadows on that dark side there and there you have it that's how I quickly lit the model for our scene here so go ahead and have some fun with this project mess around with the render settings go into the physical renderer turn on depth of field and motion blur if you want or render with depth maps and do some motion blur in after effects or program like that as you saw in the demo video I also modeled a key and animated it spinning around and some hinges in the back but this tutorial is already almost an hour long and that's pretty basic modeling so I'm not going to take the time to do that now just keep this tutorial under an hour thanks for sitting through all the way to the end I hope there was some helpful information in here I hope you learned some new techniques and tricks I know I certainly did just coming up with the idea for the tutorial I was heading down a, a whole different path and discover new ways of doing things while I was coming up with the tutorial so like I said I'm always learning myself and I'm really excited to share the information with you guys so until the next tutorial I will talk to you guys later have fun messing around with spring dynamics and cloner objects and hopefully we'll see you guys real soon bye everybody